On October the 1st, 2009, the late, great Christopher Hitchens came to Australia to appear on an episode of Q&A, Questions and Answers, where uh, people talk about all different sorts of cultural issues, political issues, economic issues, things that are happening, current affairs, that kind of thing. And, uh, and he, uh, he did not fail to, to, to be as Christopher Hitchens as he possibly could be. This is when he was absolutely dominating and killing it. And he's obviously, for people who follow him, a huge proponent of critical thinking and, and atheism and secularism. This is obviously when you could follow him because sadly he did pass away uh, close to 10 years ago now. But this is a video that I've wanted to make for a very long time now because he was such an inspiration for me. Uh, I admired him very, very deeply. I loved his ability to literally talk about any topic and it just seemed like he knew so much and could persuade because he was such an incredible thinker, uh, an enlightened soul, some would say, uh, even though there are many out there that would find a lot of irony in what I just said there, given he was an atheist and hated religion. I'm really enjoying making these discussion pieces, these pieces of content that are centered towards moderation and trying to find where the d differences and distinctions lie between people who perhaps disagree about uh, about different things. And you know, we live in a world now where it's become very, very uh, dangerous and contentious to disagree on things, but disagreements, uh, provided that they are civil, can be very, very enjoyable, even very interesting and enlightening, because if we're not all here to learn and be more of ourselves and be more of the world as a representation of us, then what are we here to do? We can love and we can be happy and we can enjoy, but so much of that goes with learning something new every day. And this is what I want these kinds of videos to be about, a vessel and a catalyst so that you can learn something as I myself learn something as I make them. So stick around. Okay, so I've taken all of the clips of Christopher Hitchens as he appeared in Q&A, and I wanted to break them down uh, with some of the discussion points and things that I think were left out, things that I agree with, things that I disagree with, and open the floor up to you as well. And you can leave a comment in the comment section. If you like this kind of stuff, you can like and subscribe as well, because I love making it. Okay, so let's dive right in. Uh, my question is that um, thousands of people dying from earthquakes, uh, to the panel question, thousands of people dying from earthquakes can't be called God's punishment. Why is it that a person being saved from under the rubble days later is um, almost invariably called a miracle? This is perhaps the most fundamental argument that the atheists uh, make against religion, this kind of God of the gaps scenario. It's not so much God of the gaps because God of the gaps is very much about, well, wherever we don't have a reason or wherever a science doesn't have an explanation for that, it must be God. And as science continues to improve and expand and, and answer more of its questions, uh, the, the gaps become a hell of a lot smaller for God to, uh, to appear in. This question is a very, very fair question. I might restate that this was obviously filmed 11 years ago, so a lot has happened within that time, but nevertheless, it is a good point. When something good happens, it is because of God's love and compassion, but when something bad happens, it's almost like God has a scapegoat and it's because it's a mystery and God works in mysterious ways and all of that of the above. One of the things that I didn't see in this episode of Q&A was a uh, consideration of the definition of God. So many people have different ideas of what God is. You just have to look at what they talk about in the East with uh, God being essentially a conjunction of opposites where God is the totality of yin and yang. God is always a circle, a mandala. God is uh, that as a friend of mine, Vijay Revikumar, said on a podcast, uh, he comes from the Eastern school. In the West, we have, at least myself, I've grown up with this Catholic idea of God being a, a supernatural being. Uh, I never really believe that he was a man with a beard in the sky sitting on a cloud and uh, he had friends around uh, a gate and, you know, St. Peter, and if you could be let in, then you were a good person. And if you had to go to hell, well, then obviously you didn't do too well uh, when you were here on uh, on earth. But there has it's so important that when we engage in these kinds of discussions that we we all agree on the on the definitions. And I never saw that once here. So what I take it from this 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 discussion here is that they are viewing God as a supernatural entity. And when you do that, 
Christopher Hitchens' point is really, really fair. It can't be such that when something good happens, God's great. But when something bad happens, well, who knows what happened? Because it just renders any need for critical thinking obsolete. And obviously, Christopher Hitchens is not about that at all. He loves doubt and theory and the need to learn and evolve. And a lot of religious people like that as well, but they just don't kind of see it that way. Now, if you're talking about God as a term to describe the transcendence of good and evil, uh, of that and not that, of the Eastern school essentially, well, then now we're having a conversation because when something good happens, anything that we don't understand essentially is that. I've spent a lot of time thinking about what God really is. And one of the reasons for that was because I struggled with a form of obsessive compulsive disorder known as religious OCD, where I was so afraid, uh, probably conditioned by my upbringing, my Catholic guilt, which I think is almost inherent in some of the ways it's, uh, it's taught, uh, that I would go to hell. So I developed this compulsion to pick up rubbish to, to prove to God in some way, some emotionally uh, satisfying way that, uh, that I was a good person and then obviously didn't uh, deserve to go to hell. And it took me a long time to kind of get over that. And that's when I fell in love with atheism. I fell in love with Dawkins and Hitchens and Sam Harris and, uh, and Dilla Hunty, people like that. And, you know, the irony of all that was that my love of atheism was, I guess, catalyzed by my fear of religion. And it was only after I um, went back in and had a look at the shadow, I suppose, uh, that I really came to enjoy some of the metaphor and the myth and the psychological significance of what religion was. And I view religion now as an evolution of morality and, uh, and of storytelling that has changed and changed over time. Do I think that there is some kind of supernatural element or force or something that transcends us? I don't know, but I have grown to not be so worried about not knowing anymore. One thing that I think we do in Western civilization, which I think acts as a real detriment to our personal and social growth, is that we we neglect a lot of the negativity, uh, not only in, in religious conversation and in religious practice, but also in the way we view the world. You know, we're, we're very much obsessed with this idea of pursuing happiness and only pursuing the good. And the more we neglect the bad, the more it comes along, like a like pushing a beach ball down in the, in the ocean. Finding that balance in life, which is obviously very cliche, but very important, comes with accepting the bad and accepting the the, the darkness and the chaos and the, the 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 symbolic feminine and the the yin of life and the more we come to accept that the more we find this more rounded approach to life and I believe that God taken from that Eastern school is is the duality as one the oneness as a lot of people talk about and when you're having a conversation of the oneness and that which we don't understand or the Tao as uh, some of the Chinese ancient philosophers would talk about, then you can start to have conversations around God being a mystery when things happen that uh, that we don't want because we can't understand it because we can only see one side. So we lack that kind of omni omniscient, omnipresent integrity. Uh, but when something good happens, it's easier for us to go with the flow. So I think as long as we're having a conversation where our definition of God is the same, then we can start to move somewhere. Something that I wrote about in my second book, which is actually coming out in the next couple of weeks now, wink, wink, is uh, is this idea of what God is. And I tried for a very long time to think about what it was. And I was reading a lot of Joseph Campbell at the time, and he wrote about the God who sits at the top of the pyramid or the eye that sees all. And his idea of God being omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent was that Whatever that wasn't, wasn't God. So if you think of something that is all powerful, uh, knows everything and is everywhere, past, present, future at all the time, the only thing that whatever that is, the only thing that that lacks is limitation. So because we're not God, because we're not all powerful, all knowing and everywhere all the time, the differences between where we are and that essentially our limitations are the work that we are, we are required to do to become more of ourselves and grow on that pursuit of uh, perfection. And that growth engenders that kind of meaning that a lot of these people uh, on the intellectual dark web in this uh, day and age talk about. This is something that Jordan Peterson talks about all the time as well. It's ubiquitous in Maps for Meaning, which is my favorite book of his 
Uh, I think it's a hell of a lot better than 12 Rules for Life, even though I do love 12, 12 Rules for Life as well. But this idea of finding meaning by moving towards a goal, and this is an existential idea as well. This is what Viktor Frankl was talking about in the 20th century uh, with his views on the world and what he learned in the concentration camps. And he eventually founded the School of Logotherapy, which was moving towards a goal and that happiness ensues as a result of mediating your, your, your personally cultivated point A and point B. And I've known that to be very, very true personally in my own life, as well as what really helped me when I was counseling um, professional, uh, professionally uh, with, with clients as well. So they're just some of the things that I think Hitchens unfortunately misses, probably because he hasn't really looked into religion at that kind of psychological depth that, uh, that people are now coming forwards and, and talking about now. From that supernatural perspective, God is a human up there or whatever it is, uh, Hitchens has every right in, in saying what he says because it's really good. It forces us to think. It forces us to consider our, our belief systems that we've been conditioned uh, as a result of childhood or where we've grown up and, 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 and start to consider those. But where I would like to see more of, and obviously you can't now, which is such a loss, but where I would have loved to see this conversation flow a little bit more is coming back to the the actual the benefit of the stories and, and what they have done to, to help people find out how to act in life. And Hitchens, he was a, he was a, as a good friend of Richard Dawkins, who was a, a scientific fundamentalist, dare I say it. And science obviously is concerned very much with what is, as opposed to how to be or what should be. And this is the major difference between the two. And this is why there have been so many arguments between people who sit on the what is side, and therefore can we infer morality from what there is, as opposed to do we need to cultivate some of our own morality based upon the way human beings act. So I think they're just some of the reasons why Hitchens is, uh, isn't very much liked in the, in the, in the religious um, schools. But at the same time, he's such an important or he was such an important thinker and it's such a tragedy that we lost him and he's still a, a massive uh, inspiration for me and someone who I look up to massively still to this day. What is God to you? This is a question that I would love for you to uh, comment in the section below. What is your definition of God? And, uh, and how does that help you with your morality? Are you in fact an atheist? And do you infer your morality from what is and what can be measured? It's, it's probably the stupidest thing the human race does is to look for patterns in this way and say, when a baby falls out of a high rise building and bounces on the grass below, that must be God. And when uh, millions of children die every day for the lack of pure drinking water and just die of diarrhea, in a banal manner, that's because God moves in a mysterious way or isn't involved at all. So again, Hitchens here is talking about uh, human beings and their ability to recognize patterns even when there aren't any. And I think he makes a really good point. I think one thing that we have to do all the time is try to get around our own echo chambers and, and our own ways that we might fall into unconscious biases. And when we're doing that, we can really start to see, oh, hang on, what have I just done here? Have I just found a pattern where there is none? Do I need to take a breath? Do I need to meditate perhaps? Do I need to chill out? Or do I need to ask someone who I trust Trust for some kind of uh, audit, perhaps, or fair, honest advice. Natural disasters happen, and an omnipotent God lets them happen, if for those of us who believe in God. Uh, several leaders of the Christian Church, as you know, said about the last tsunami that it was a punishment. In Britain, several of them said it was a punishment for homosexuality. Oddly enough, the San Francisco earthquake only hit when San Francisco was famous for other things. <laughs> When New Orleans got flooded, the only bits that didn't get flooded were the red light district. Okay? So anyone who says they know God's mind in this had better not mind looking a bit foolish. Hitchens didn't really like that idea of saying that an omnipotent God lets them happen because obviously... I suppose his argument is, uh, is against that supernatural idea. And in my honest opinion, as much as I love Christopher Hitchens, as much as I love Richard Dawkins, all these other kinds of people, is that that is an argument that a, a 10-year-old could make, really. I remember when I was growing up, I would ask about Father Christmas and I would ask about the Easter Bunny. And obviously, I would ask about God. It just seemed to me like the next thing to consider. Who is Santa Claus? Well, it's mum and dad. Who's Easter Bunny? Also happens to be mum and dad. Who is God? Well, that's obviously not mum and dad as much as they probably would like me to think. Uh, no, I love mum and dad. But it's a very simple question to consider, you know, and one of the good things about these kinds of atheists and critical thinkers is that they help us 
transcend those ideas that we can become almost brainwashed by, really. And I don't think we should ever stop considering different positions. Um, you typically stereotype religious people as dogmatic and fundamentalists. No, um, how is this when people who listen to you um, feel as if you're the one being dogmatic and fundamentalist in your evangelical pursuit to convert the world to atheism? This is a very good question. It's a very provocative question. And uh, I think it's pretty fair, to be honest with you. I think uh, one of the things that Christopher Hitchens uh, kind of failed at, in my opinion, was to consider the Eastern school of religion. And uh, he, he was his attack was very much against, again, I'd say it, that supernatural idea, that, that Christianized idea of a theistic God and, 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 a, and a man or whatever it was to look down on the earth and kind of judge who was good and who was bad and this is what needs to happen and this is what doesn't need to happen. And I think his claim, as I said before, and as I said many times in uh, friendly discussions, is a very fair claim to make. But his own critical thinking kind of stopped at that. And religion is, is so big and vast and expansive and because so many genres and, and, and different ideas. And one of the things that Jordan Peterson is really pushing for in this day and age is the psychological significance to religion and the evolution of morality and storytelling and how myth evolved from this abstract representation looking at ourselves and looking at ourselves and trying to figure out what we're doing and figure out what we're doing and, and going and going and going until you have myth and then philosophy and then science. But before that, there was religion and, and how these stories evolved. And I think sometimes, uh, I know I have certainly in the past, and I think other people who like that side or perhaps are the first time listening to this kind of atheistic way of thinking, uh, take offense to what Hitchens says because it seems very dogmatic. And it, it should be when we're talking about some of the more fundamentalist ideas around religion, but not so much when it's talking about this subjectivism, this, this kind of approach to intuition and how the stories create uh, pragmatic ways of viewing the world. I think anytime we're having a discussion about religion or God or secularism, we want to be really, really aware of trying to come away from the the yes and the no and the absolutes essentially. I think that's the critical issue here and I think that's the one that Hitchens is overly concerned with. It's not necessarily what God is but what God uh, makes people do. And as we've seen over the centuries and the millennia, not only uh, in Islam and Christianity but all sorts of different religions and, and ways of viewing the world, uh, there are both very bad things that can happen and very good things that can happen. And again, this is why I'm so concerned with trying to move away from absolutes, not only in the uh, religious and secularism ideas, but also in politics as well. We don't want to be so far right that we think, you know, uh, minorities are bad people. And we don't want to be so far left that we think all of democracy is bad and needs to be revolutionized and changed. And we can find that middle ground by having these kinds of discussions. I think when you start to see these stories, not necessarily as God's truth, as a, as a very dogmatic approach to this is what God said, this is how it must be, but you see it as a way of interpreting the world, we can start to chop and change a little bit more. And I think that's really, really necessary because obviously these stories were written so long ago, a lot of what they talk about now still reigns true. Obviously, I don't want you to kill me. I would like it if I could uh, hold my aggression and not kill you. Uh, but some of it needs an update. And obviously, the socio-cultural norms that were present then are not present now with the rise of globalism and, and China and what's going on in the US and technology advancements and big tech companies. These things are a very, very big modern dilemmas. And it's not enough to just get all of your morality from one book. And I think we need to observe and interpret different ideas and have different discussions and grow uh, like we should in all facets of our lives. My question is to uh, Mr. Hitchens again. Um, how do you account for the uh, good work, uh, specifically regarding the title of your book, uh, Religion Poisoning Everything, uh, the good work done by uh, religious aid organisations overseas in third world and developing countries, as well as um, locally um, on our own shores and I'm sure in, in your country uh, with the homeless and the needy. Now, to the point about religious activism, activism, isn't it true, haven't you all heard, that Hamas does so well because it supplies social services? Are you going to say that it's the same is true for Hamas and Islamic Jihad. Never mind that they're religious, they distribute services where otherwise there'd only be secularism and corruption. Well, 
if you want to claim that, you can't just claim the charitable part of it, it seems to me. Mother Teresa, endlessly praised for work that most of the time she actually never did. I went to watch her very closely in Calcutta. You don't mind that she thinks that what Bengal and Calcutta mainly needs is a campaign, a clerical campaign, against birth control and family planning. Has anyone here ever been to Bengal and concluded that's what it really needs? <laughs> that's what she was really campaigning for, in case you're worried. But never mind. She gives a wonderful impression of being a charitable person. So what Indians need is more missionaries to cure poverty, when everybody knows there's only one cure for poverty, which is the empowerment of women, which means giving them some control over their reproduction. <laughs> name me, you name me a Catholic or Muslim charity that goes into the fields determined to secure the empowerment okay, of women. Well, let one thing that I will say about the discussion between religion and atheism or religion and science, I suppose, is that we now live in a world where we are conscious enough and educated enough, at least for the most of us or a lot of us in the Western world, to actually discuss these ideas of do we need religion anymore to be good people? And I actually don't think that gives a whole lot of credit to religion where it should be. I think our morality has grown and evolved through religious discourse over thousands of years, and we can only get to a point now where we can have this discussion. Do we still need these stories, or is it just obvious now that we should teach every child uh, about honesty and humility and uh, not killing each other? I think that's a really important point to consider because I suppose one thing that I'm thinking of now is can we cultivate some kind of global spirituality uh, that comes not so much from stories about what people did in the past, but how we can use that now for past and future. Guys, thank you so much for watching. I'm really enjoying making these videos. I love these kinds of people. I love these thinkers and I want to do more analyses and discussion points and uh, I'm loving the responses I'm getting from them. So thanks so much and I'll see you next time.